he'll be talking about that sort of uh, Internet of Things and how that, uh, what it might mean for product development. Diego, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Del, for the introduction and, and thank you for, for being here. Earlier today, uh, my boss, uh, Andrew Anagnost, uh, was talking about the, the three major forces of, uh, that are going on in the future of making things. So he talked about the fact that the means of production are, are intellectual and physical are changing. The means, the consumption, behavior, and, and requirements are changing too. And the product and what it means to be a useful product and the fact that it's interconnected to other products and systems and what is the new definition of a useful product. So he was gracious enough to leave some stuff for me to talk about and, <laughs> and I'll focus on this part of the product specifically on the, on the Internet of Things and what it means for product development. So the, I have the obligatory slide of uh, what is the opportunity, right? Or, uh, besides the fact that this is frigging cool, uh, what is the opportunity, right? So there will be, there are already more things connected to the internet than people in the planet. By 2020, some people say they're going to be 50 billion, some are saying 30 billion. The point is there are going to be lots. And uh, IDC, for example, says that by 20, uh, 2020, there are going to be 30 billion things connected to the IoT and uh, sales uh, uh, revenue uh, uh, of uh, $8.9 trillion by 2020. Lots of money to be made there. So enough of that. That sounds great. But what is new about this IoT thing, right? Uh, we've been connecting things to the internet for quite some time, I mean, namely computers, tablets, smartphones. So what's the hype about? Well. It's a good question, and depending on who you ask, at least our view is that what the, the things that are different about the IoT is, first of all, the variety of things that are getting connected to the Internet of Things. So pretty much anything now is getting an IP and can talk to and, be, and, and receive messages from any other thing with an IP. And of course, with the uh, decreasing cost of uh, sensors and actuators, it's making things much more interesting beyond uh, what we already have with, with smart tablets and smartphones and computers. So, so we're seeing I mean, all this variety of things. Interesting one is the one with the cow, uh, uh, also known as the Internet of Cows. And uh, what, what uh, Betsy there has is that she transmits uh, her state, whether he's, she's ill or pregnant, and uh, for, for the farmers to do something about it. And this particular cow uh, transmits around, it's not a whole lot, but 20 megabytes of data per year. So imagine a whole. So interesting. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, in the Internet of Things, uh, nobody knows you're a fridge. Uh, this has nothing to do with the previous slide. I just thought that it was cute. <laughs> so the, the, one of the interesting things about the Internet of Things and connecting everyday objects to the internet is that it's expanding, it's, it's actually renewing the, the old things we had around our lives. So take the humble uh, uh, door lock. We've been developing and having uh, uh, locks for, for many, many decades. But now let's connect this thing to the internet. Hey, why not, right? So uh, in this case, Lockitron has uh, this uh, 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 lock that opens your door over the internet. And and then they develop a, a REST-based uh, API for anybody to do stuff with that. So, so basically, with the, this API, you can control, is it open, is it closed? You can even change the direction of the lock to left-handed or right-handed. <clears throat> so immediately, you see applications popping up. Uh, you can open and close your, your door from your uh, pebble. And, oh, sorry. And uh, it detects vibration, so if somebody's knocking at the door, it'll send you a, a, a text saying somebody's at the door. Extremely useful, perhaps not, but God is interesting. So the other thing that is different about the IoT is, the, is that even if you are the designer and the developer of the device, you cannot predict in advance the scenarios in which it's going to be participating. So for example, uh, 
uh, if you are the developer of a, of a IoT connected uh, alarm clock, uh, you could end up in this scenario where you say, for example, the calendar, your meeting was pushed back, or there is a traffic jam, or, or the, uh, there was an accident, or your train is late, and it tells you alarm to, to, to let you sleep a couple of more minutes, and your coffee maker uh, also can connect to the alarm and, and uh, uh, start your coffee uh, right before you wake up. And this is, by the way, from uh, Cisco uh, infographics. So interesting stuff that the makers of the alarm clock itself couldn't really predict. So that makes, think about it, I mean, that makes uh, designing a product a little bit more challenging. And of course, you could end up with undecidable scenarios like this one where you, where you scale, uh, 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 closes the access to your, to your refrigerator when you're getting too, too heavy. The other interesting thing about the, 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 the IoT that is different is that intelligence is moving from the controllers of the individual devices to the collective network. So, so what that means is that, that the, the decision, I mean, intel, intelligence in a machine is really algorithm that control the behavior. There's nothing magical about it. But, but it goes from the decision being made at the device level to, to the system level. So you can do a system level optimizations like the one illustrated in this picture of a GE turbine, wind turbine, where when a turbine participates in a wind farm, uh, they can adjust the, the blades and the direction depending on, on the wind, the pressure, and, and one, once one individual turbine makes those changes, it communicates the changes to the other turbines so, uh, to, to maximize power output. No human intervention necessary, really. I mean, they can talk to each other happily, and, and they can adjust. And of course, uh, you could have uh, some intelligent devices that do stuff uh, uh, out of spite to humans. The other, I mean, I'm, I'm saying all this stuff is obvious. I'm just stating the obvious. Now, these devices, they, you, we used to de design products and devices that that was basically it. Now we're designing actually computer platforms that, that are supposed to be extended either by your own developers or third party developers that you, you're still to, gonna know. So, so they, they expose things on APIs and it, it, it's so, you, we're so used to that from the smartphone and the computer that sometimes we miss the point that this is happening in, in products that used to be exclusively mechanical or electrical. And now, of course, these things uh, have sensors. Uh, I mentioned earlier that one of the things fueling the Internet of Things revolution is that the sensor, the prices of sensors have gone down. As a result, you have this billions of devices is, is effectively a, a, an army of data collection devices that are pumping data into, into the big data bucket. So it's very interesting to think about the kind of stuff we can do with that data. And, and I don't think that we have still figured that out for real. I mean, uh, you could have uh, 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 people like Google having these uh, interesting scenarios from the data that they, that they <laughs> they collect from our house. <laughs> Scary, but potentially true. <laughs> All right. So uh, in a nutshell, the, the IoT has fundamentally changed the nature of how we design products and, and, and how the hardware and the software have come together uh, to become one. And, and also what customers expect from these products. So gonna, for the second part of my presentation, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the IoT, the ecosystem. Who are the people who develop IoT products? Uh, what does that mean? Well, I think that there, there, there is enough opportunity in the IoT ecosystem and enough opportunities for innovation uh, for, for to keep a lot of people happy. So the, the first group, and, 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 and I have four groups. The first group is the 
the, those who make the things that connect to the IoT. So these are the, the, the product developers, the actual developers of the devices. So what's interesting here is that the designers in these teams have to really change the perspective from designing individual devices to keep connectivity in mind from the start. So they, they have to, to come to terms with the, with the role of software and electronics with, in, their, in their products. And also, like uh, uh, Andrew mentioned uh, earlier, and like it's uh, illustrated here with this uh, picture of Tesla here, is that consumers or uh, uh, customers are expecting things to get better with time with software over the wire software uh, updates. So this was a, a very publicized ca case from Tesla uh, a few months ago where they actually improved the, the behavior of the suspension system with a software, an over, over the wire software update, which is fascinating if you think about the implications of such a model for support. The other, the other characteristic is that people in these groups have to become, obviously, more comfor comfortable than ever uh, in working with multidisciplinary teams. And, and this takes a new dimension because you have, like I said, electronics, communications, networking, etc. And uh, you, you have to start thinking about, even if you are a small uh, uh, shop, start thinking about how do you do your systems engineering. And, and also related to that, there is so much to know that, that nobody can really contain all the knowledge necessary to build one of these. And, and, and uh, you have to get smarter into using open source hardware, uh, uh, stealing, I mean, reusing IP, and uh, so because you cannot do everything yourself. The second group of uh, members in the ecosystem are those who develop the software uh, that, that runs into these things. So these are, pro uh, they could be software developers from the, from the device manufacturer or third party developers that leverage the APIs. So here, for example, uh, you have the, that on the top left is the, the, the IDE, the uh, inter uh, developer environment for smart things, which is a web-based IDE uh, to develop applications on top of the home automation systems that, uh, of smart things. The Fitbit API, you can get all the information from the, from the Fitbit, uh, calories, steps, distance, and do whatever you want to do with that. And uh, that's a, an example of the Mercedes-Benz who has a, an integration with Nest uh, using Nest APIs that, that sets the temperature of your house where you are driving with your Mercedes into the house. So those are APIs. And also there are platforms. Uh, there are several platforms. That basically, the way I understand them is that like uh, middleware in the cloud to facilitate uh, uh, IoT scenarios. So, I, is anyone familiar with IFTTT? So that stands for uh, if this then that. Check it out. It's, it's, it's very interesting. They have channels that people have developed for many IoT devices that can do, and, and you define your own recipe, they're called. So if somebody knocks on the door, uh, I don't know, turn the fire alarm on, uh, or send, most of them are send text messages or emails. And uh, uh, Massimo uh, earlier mentioned these two. Uh, there, are, there are companies forming their own uh, cartels, I'm sorry, consortia, to, <laughs> to, to uh, uh, forward the advancement of, uh, of uh, standards. And uh, I, I heard something funny the other day that the standards are like toothbrushes, that everybody needs one, but nobody wants to use somebody else's. So <laughs> standards are just like that. So, so you see the companies, right? Uh, and the list is preliminary. The, I mean, this is just, uh, I mean, the, uh, I, I, I'm sure people here in the, in the room kind of uh, is reminded of the Betamax and VHS thing. This is kind of that, but bigger. And uh, it was very important for the ones developing the software and the hardware is that depending on which of these you end up adopting, your design may change dramatically. So for example, uh, uh, the thread group, their purpose is to do a, a low level battery consumption. Whereas if you want to play nice with, with Apple, 
you have to be Wi-Fi certified, which means bigger battery uh, and power consumption. If you design for one, you may not be able to to play in the other in the other band. So these are profound design implications. Uh, the standard who that you decide to adopt, or the standard that wins if there is one a single one. I I don't think there will be a single one. <clears throat> That was the second group. The third group are those who analyze the big data. So these are the people, I mean, remember, we have this army of data collection devices pumping data into this big, big data bucket. What, now, what do you do with it? There are very interesting applications, and some companies are already doing that. That is, how to improve my processes and my designs based on the data that I'm getting from my products that are on the wild. Now, this is a tremendous opportunity. You, many people do, could make a living out of that, particularly because the, the talent to, to do this is scarce. I mean, here you, do, you need data analysts, mathematicians, statisticians that are normally uh, in Wall Street, not developing products. And then the, probably the least interesting to this crowd, but of course important are the Cisco's and the G's and the and the AT&T's who developed the, the iron that on which the IoT is uh, developed. So a, a word about hardware startups. Uh, Andrew, uh, uh, my boss mentioned earlier, and, and I repeat it, we, we love uh, hardware startups and uh, we love entrepreneurs and, and maker pros and the reason is because uh, at least personally, I think that they are better positioned to to be successful in the IoT uh, in the IoT uh, uh, race, and it's basically a matter of size and momentum. I mean, what's happening not only with the IoT but with innovation in general is that smaller companies have the agility to respond to the to the to the innovations and the new technologies. However, what they don't have is of course the, the 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 expertise on how to bring the product from from one to ten thousand. Like we've mentioned, there were other talks yesterday about that, right? So that's where you see uh, uh, the role of the the accelerators and, and incubators as becoming increase at least in our view increasingly important to help with with mentorship, uh, design for manufacturability, consulting, uh, sourcing. Uh, uh, and actually sometimes even design and, and, and commercialization of the products of these uh, geniuses out of Stanford who cannot manufacture anything uh, if their life depended on it. So, so I, sorry, I, I, let's say Georgia Tech. <laughs> so my alma mater. So, uh, okay, so, so those are the hardware setups. So, in closing, uh, uh, the IoT represents a, a real opportunity. I mean, there is no hype about it. And uh, to make money, to generate jobs, uh, and, and just like the internet generated a thriving ecosystem of developers and fantastic applications 20, 30 years ago, the IoT is poised to, to do the same thing for, for hardware in the, in the, definitely in the next few years. So with that, I'll leave you with that, and uh, thank you very much.